two. Second Kings 22, the history or part of it uh, of Josiah, King Josiah. And I'd like to speak of it because it is such, I believe, such a wonderfully simple picture of how uh, a soul may receive forgiveness and assurance of eternal life, assurance of forgiveness assurance of pardon and of eternal life. A wonderful example uh, that the Lord does not despise the broken in heart, the opposite, uh, that he dwells with those who are of a humble and of a contrite spirit. And although I cannot say that here we have Josiah's conversion, uh, yet it is the experience of many, really, in conversion. Uh, and in that sense, a way of illustrating how we can be saved. He hears the warnings of God's word. And he, in the simplest sense, believes them. Uh, he does not argue about it. He believes what he hears. He is greatly troubled in his own heart. He is the king. He is responsible in one sense before God for the land. And he is troubled as to what is to come to pass. But he believes God's word. And he humbles himself before the Lord. And he seeks the Lord's uh, wisdom. What will happen from the prophetess? And he is given an answer of peace from the Lord. And he shows, though he didn't read it in chapter 3 from his actions, that his repentance is very genuine. Uh, and in the same way, Christian conversion is very simple. It is uh, seeing from the Lord's word, whether directly reading it or indirectly hearing it taught, uh, but hearing and seeing our need, our sin, uh, and believing the Lord's word and the warnings in it, and humbly seeking the Lord's forgiveness. Uh, and he is very willing to give it, very gracious, ever willing to receive sinners to himself. But with that in mind, if we can simply go through uh, the narrative. Uh, it begins, begins, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 30 and one years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jedida, the daughter of Adiah of Boscath. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in all the way of David his father, and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. He became king at a very young age. His father, Ammon, reigned for only two years before he was killed by a conspiracy of his own servants. And his grandfather, but his grandfather Manasseh, before that reigned for 55 years. And both of them uh, were very wicked men and led the people very greatly astray. Manasseh, certainly, we read, repented and himself was forgiven and pardoned towards the end of his reign. But he was unable, with what little time left he had, to change much. Uh, and we read uh, in these later chapters how much Josiah had to change and reform. But for many years, he had led the people in idolatry, in witchcraft, and in persecuting the people of God, those that trusted the Lord themselves. And Ammon, his son, appears to have been little different and continued uh, in that course. But Josiah, not so. Why that was, humanly speaking, we're not told, though I think we may presume that his mother was a good influence. It is interesting 
that just about all the kings, we have their mother's name given to us. Uh, and obviously a mother's influence can be very great. Uh, but also, I'm sure that he had in some measure uh, upright in the least counselors, those to, to help him uh, as a child to rule. Uh, and it may be, we don't know that the Lord had saved him at an early age. We don't know precisely, uh, but from the time that he begins to reign, he does that which is upright and good. Uh, we read he begins to reign at eight years old, and I won't turn to it, but in the account in First Chronicles, we read how at 12, or sorry, in Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles 34, uh, he began to put away the idolatrous, the idols and the idolatrous places of worship that were there in Israel and had been there for some years. Uh, and he does exactly in one sense what, uh, as a king, he ought to do. He had authority to banish idols. He had authority to uh, uh, not, he couldn't change their hearts, but to set up right worship in Jerusalem. And this is what he begins to do. And in the 18th year, when he's 18, uh, come one might say to maturity, so his opportunity for doing good increases and the Lord deals with him uh, in a wonderful way. Uh, verse three, and it came to pass in the 18th year of, the, of King Josiah that the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshullam, the scribe to the house of the Lord, saying, go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, that he may sum the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the door have gathered of the people. And let them deliver it into the hand of the doers of the work that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And let them give it to the doers of the work, which is in the house of the Lord, to repair the breaches of the house. That for many years, it would appear that the temple had been left and had been gradually getting tattier and tattier and uh, now there was need for it to be repaired and made right for the worship of God and so he sets about practically gathering the money organizing telling the people the uh, high priest to, to, to begin to repair the house of the Lord and that is what they do but whilst they're doing it, and we're not told precisely, but it would not be uh, inconceivable that as they were tidying, as they were clearing away rubbish and so on, they find something very precious. Uh, verse eight, and Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord, and Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. They found a copy of the law of Moses, at the very least, a copy of Deuteronomy, but quite probably the whole uh, of the law. And uh, why, uh, what had happened to it, we're not told. Maybe Manasseh or Ammon or his servants had, uh, as it were, put it away, and in the providence of God, it had not been destroyed. Maybe uh, the servants of the Lord had hidden it. They were uh, called, there was to be a copy set aside, put by the ark of God within the tabernacle and then within the temple to be there for always. And obviously, they would have made copies, but uh, it would appear that there was no copy easily available at the time, but they find this reserved copy uh, and they read it. Uh, it seems funny to us in the day when we all can have a Bible that these things were so precious uh, and they were directed 
Josiah seeking to do good without the immediate guidance of the word of God. But they read it. Hilkiah, I mean, Hilkiah may not have been able to read, but Shaphan, as a scribe, could read. Uh, Shaphan reads it. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of them that do the work and have oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And quite possibly Josiah himself couldn't read but Shaphan reads it to him. And the response is remarkable. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. The Hebrew, the Jewish way of showing great sorrow and anguish to tear their clothes. And simply the reading of some portion of the law of Moses, Josiah is greatly troubled by. Now, what was it? What was it that troubled him? Well, uh, I'll read a portion or two. There are some portions in uh, the law of Moses that are very solemn, very solemn warnings or prophecies. One might read portions uh, of how the tabernacle is to be made uh, and say, well, that's not too threatening. Uh, but there are portions that Moses is very, very plain uh, in what he says that will happen if the people of Israel turn away from the Lord uh, and worship idols. If you'd like to turn with me, there's two, particularly Leviticus 26, uh, and also Deuteronomy 28. But uh, let me just read. Leviticus 26 begins with uh, promises of blessing uh, if they would walk in his commandments and in his statutes, but then uh, just up to verse 13, uh, but then from verse 14, the rest of the chapter is very solemn warnings. But if ye will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments, and if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and the burning ache, that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. Ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And I will set my face against you, and ye shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when none pursueth you. And if ye will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins, and I will break the pride of your power now make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass and your strength shall be spent in vain for your land shall not yield her increase. Neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. And it continues. Uh, and, the, uh, and as if the people are stubborn and will not listen, the Lord will bring sorrow upon sorrow uh, upon them. And uh, if I might just read from verse 30 and 31, particular warnings to the city and Jerusalem and the sanctuary there. And I will destroy your high places and cut down your images and cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols and my soul shall abhor you. Now make your cities waste and bring your sanctuaries unto desolation and I will not smell the savour of your sweet odours, and I will bring the land into desolation, and your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. And then verse 33, and I will scatter you among the heathen 
nor draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. Very solemn warnings, uh, and it will go on. He does promise, though, uh, at the end, the end of the chapter is a promise of forgiveness and pardon and restoration if they will turn. Uh, verse 40, if they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they have trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that I also have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies. If then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, then and they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then I will I remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham. Will I remember, and I will remember the land, and that he would in time forgive them. But there are these very solemn warnings. And uh, Josiah, it is very simple. He hears these. He knows what has been going on in Israel, in Judah. He knows the wickedness of Manasseh. He knows the way of the people continuing in those ways. He knows the idol worship that has been going on. And it is not hard for him uh, to simply put two and two together. This is what we have done. This is what the Lord promises will happen if we do those things. I am very worried and troubled that this is what the Lord is going to do. And I, as king, I am responsible in one sense. What can I do? Uh, and rightly, he tears his clothes. Rightly, he is greatly troubled. And no doubt, in, in praise, no doubt, uh, in a certain way, in his own way, seeks the Lord. But if I may pause there, the Bible, this were, these were words given to the Jews, the, Israelite, the children of Israel of old. But more generally, the Bible is very simple and plain in its warnings to mankind. Uh, that we will face the judgment that because of our sin, God must punish sin uh, and God will punish it. And God uh, will ultimately send those who will not repent to hell. There is a place called hell. We don't often speak of it explicitly, but the Lord Jesus is very plain and clear in his teaching that it is a very, uh, to warn people that there it is very real uh, and very worthy of our fear uh, and of our consideration. Let me read his words from Mark chapter 9. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched, never ceasing punishment. But if thou, and if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt or lame into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched, and so on. And he three times he, he gives these words where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched, that there will be, <coughs> sorry, gnawing, as it were, pain and fire for always. And uh, Revelation 20, uh, elsewhere also, but uh, uh, speaking, warning us of that punishment yet to come, verse 20, verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, 
and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. They were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Very solemn things, solemn matters, but we must uh, speak of them because it would be very wrong or wicked to deceive and to say these things are not so. But the scriptures are very plain and simple that there is a judgment. God will call all men to, to judgment either when we die or when he returns. Uh, and those of us uh, whose sins are not forgiven face the, the certainty of eternal sorrow uh, in hell. Uh, and in one sense, God simply sets, us, sets it before us as he did Josiah and would have us to consider and to ponder and in a simple way, take him very simply at his word. Uh, and uh, to, if at all possible, he gives us this example to show us that there is mercy and pardon uh, and forgiveness if we will but humbly believe that those threats and humbly seek his forgiveness. And uh, uh, Josiah is a wonderful example. Uh, he says, it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. He was struck uh, very solemnly in his heart. And what does he do? Does he hide away? Does he sort of uh, cover it up, sweep it under the carpet uh, and say, well, we're not going to read that anymore, put that book away? No, he sends, one might say, an official delegation to find out if this is what is going to happen. Uh, and the king commanded Hilkiah the priest and Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, and Akbor the son of Micaiah, Shaphan the scribe, and Asahiah, a servant of the king, saying, Go ye, inquire of the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book, to do according unto all that which is written concerning us. And so they go to a lady, a prophetess, a genuine prophetess uh, who lived in Jerusalem, and they ask her in so many words, is this, we have read this, is this what is going to come to pass? And uh, she firstly confirms it. Uh, Verse 15, she said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man that sent you to me. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah hath read, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. She is a, a, a prophetess, cannot go against what the Lord has spoken <coughs> upon me in his word. These things shall come to pass. And one has to say a preacher cannot uh, say uh, hell will not be, judgment will not be, don't worry about it. It won't come to pass. God will let you off. We must be honest. We must be plain. But then also she gives him a gracious reply of mercy. Uh, verse 18. But to the king of Judah, which sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, as touching the words which thou hast heard, because thine heart was tender, Thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord when thou heardest what I spake against this place, against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation and a curse. 
has rent thy clothes and wept before me, I also have heard thee, saith the Lord. Behold, therefore, I will gather thee unto thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered into thy grave in peace, and thine eyes shall not see all the evil which I will bring upon this place. And they brought the word, the king word again. In so many words, the Lord says, it shall happen, it must come to pass, but I will show mercy to you because you have humbled yourself uh, and uh, as it were, been tender hearted, broken hearted as the scripture says, and you will see peace. And it is the same today, this world, will be judged. This world must be judged. Uh, I mentioned this morning that there is still the guilt of putting to death the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, upon this world. Uh, men continue to do very wickedly, uh, and the world must, and there are many things that are not judged by men. God must judge the world and must bring it to an end but there is mercy and forgiveness for every individual who, whose heart is tender, who will humble themselves before the Lord and will ask the Lord for forgiveness and pardon. There are many promises that the Lord gives in his word to exactly that uh, effect. Uh, let me just turn to one or two. The first words uh, of the first recorded sermon by the Lord Jesus Christ uh, is precisely uh, those promises. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who are humble and tender hearted as Josiah was, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Wonderful promises that if we but see our need, our danger, see our danger, we ask the Lord for forgiveness and pardon, he will most certainly hear and forgive and give us an answer uh, of peace. Let me just read two more. Don't turn to them. I have them in my notes. Isaiah 57 verse 15, a wonderful gracious promise. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. And Psalm 51, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. The Lord has sent his son into the world, the Lord Jesus Christ, not to judge, not to condemn the world. He could have so easily come and simply brought the world to an end and judged all as one day he will but he came to save and he came to suffer and to die, to bear that punishment so that any and all who will trust in him would not bear that punishment uh, and bear, not bear the wrath of God for their sin and be set free and forgiven and shown mercy. God is wonderfully gracious, wonderfully willing to forgive any who will humble themselves and turn to him. Uh, and Josiah is a wonderful example. Uh, he did, uh, well, going on briefly, we read in chapter 23, uh, peace is promised to him. He uh, is very serious. He takes the people as king. He gathers them together. He uh, has the, the book of the Lord read before them, and he makes a solemn pledge, verse 3 of chapter 23. Uh, the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies. 
and so on. And all the people stood to the covenant. And then they very thoroughly burn and break down all the idol places of idol worship from verse 4. King commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, and the priests of the second order, the keepers of the door, to bring forth out of the temple all of the vessels that were made for Baal, and so on. And he burned them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron. And he's very thorough. Uh, it the, uh, goes on thing after thing that has been there, even the very wicked uh, verse 10, he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the children of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter to pass through the fire to Molech. That was their means of worshipping Molech, to sacrifice their babies in fire to the idol. But all these things, uh, far more thoroughly than any before him, uh, destroying the idols, getting rid of them, uh, and fulfilling ultimately a prophecy made many, some centuries before, that he would destroy the idols uh, and altar at Bethel. But uh, they do so, they keep the Passover, uh, and uh, they do everything that is right. Uh, but the Lord would in time truly fulfill his word, Josiah was spared. He did die later in his 39th year when he went to fight against Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, who had come up to fight against the Babylonians. Uh, but he saw not the judgment of God upon Jerusalem, upon the temple, uh, upon the people of God. Uh, one might say, why did the Lord not fully pardon the nation as a whole? Well, I think the basic reason is because they did not repent. Josiah repented, and as king he was, could destroy all the idols, but as a people they retained their idolatry. I won't turn to it, but we read elsewhere in Jeremiah, they still secretly uh, worship the queen of heaven. Uh, they still did not put their trust in the Lord. None of them, or not none of them, but many still had not themselves repented and trusted in the mercy of God. Uh, and all one can say is we can only believe for ourselves how we would wish that by our repentance, a whole nation could be forgiven, but it cannot be so. God deals with us as individuals. God calls us as individuals to humbly seek him and to confess our sin to him. Now, God's mercy is very free, is very gracious, but we won't, in all honesty, seek him until we see our need. Uh, I was hearing the testimony of a man, very violent rugby player, uh, who only began to seek the Lord when he was in a prison, in a police cell, uh, and was expecting to have a prison sentence. Uh, and he simply humbly prayed that the Lord would help him. Uh, and if he would help him, he would, as it were, be given to the Lord. He, he knew nothing, not much more. Uh, and then he came uh, to put his trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Great missionary, William Carey. He came to the Lord because his sin was discovered, because he had deceitfully swapped uh, a, a, a coin of his master's, and his master had found out, and he was expecting to be kicked out of his employment. Uh, but he sought the Lord's mercy, and the Lord heard him and made him a, a wonderful messenger and servant uh, of his own. And it is the same for any of us and for all of us. I came to the Lord through reading uh, Revelation, really, rev reading through Revelation, seeking the Lord in much darkness and ignorance, but seeing 
that I had no hope of heaven from what I had done, very wicked life, but foolishly thinking, as people do, you assume we will go to heaven. But I saw from what the scriptures told me, as it plainly does, that I had no hope and I needed the Lord's forgiveness and eventually sought the Lord in the right way and simply going to him and confessing my sin to him and he heard and forgive. And so it is for all who will be saved. Very wonderfully simple mercy uh, and and a simple believing of God's word, of his threats, of his warning, of our need of forgiveness. He has done everything necessary for us to be forgiven. The Lord Jesus Christ has suffered and died, risen again, is there, God's right hand, willing to hear our cries. And he came and will give forgiveness and pardon to all who turn to him. Josiah's repentance, the genuineness of it was seen in his actions. Uh, and if we truly come to the Lord, it will be seen in the way that we live. Uh, but he simply says, come to me, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And may he help us if we've never done so, if we, if we don't know that we've done so, to look to him and to call upon him for mercy and he will hear and most certainly forgive and receive us. Amen.